the eternal Son of God, he started his ministry by spreading the gospel. In doing so, he shined a great light in a place where there had been darkness, a good bit of darkness. And there's darkness out there in our world today. I don't think I have to tell any one of you that. I don't think anyone's naive to think any differently. But there's not only darkness that what we see manifestly in our nation or around the world with sin and conflict, but there's darkness in the hearts of people who don't know Jesus. And the reality is they will die in their sins without him. So let's do what we're called to do, what Paul calls us to do, and imitate Christ by focusing our personal ministries on spreading the gospel. For our Lord and Savior did the same within his ministry. This morning we continue our series in Matthew's Gospel with chapter 4, verses 12 through 25. We'll begin with a reading from verses 12 through 13. Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, some time had passed since verse 11, when Jesus defeated the devil in the wilderness, if we remember from the previous message. Look, some time had passed. In that time, as is mentioned here, John the Baptist was arrested. And we know this by comparing it to some of the other Gospels. But it's just critical to note he was arrested in the interim from the verse 11. So from 411 to what we just read, John the Baptist has been arrested. Some time has passed. And Jesus has now moved deeper into the Galilee region to begin his ministry. Now, Capernaum was and is a special place. But, yes, oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was supposed to have a clicker and I didn't have it, so th thank you for that. Oh, you have, okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Now, it was and is a special place. It sits on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee in what is arguably the most beautiful area in Israel. And it was Jesus' main base of operation during his ministry. And today, if you go into the entrance, it even has this big sign called the Town of Jesus. Now, I have a photo of that as well, of my wife and I standing by the entrance to Capernaum. But I'm wearing a Star Trek shirt and, you know, some kind of weird cargo pants. And I felt like the, that aspect of the photo would be too distracting for everybody. <laughs> so I chose not to use that one. So I, this is a photo I took that I actually think is helpful, even though you just kind of see some ruins, because you see these black, these are just sort of black rocks. These ruins date to the time of Jesus. So these were there. And you can't see it, but to the left of this photo, there's a synagogue there now that dates to a few hundred years after Jesus. However, the base of it is the same as these rocks. It's black. It's like, I think it's called black basalt. Not really a geologist, but it's some kind of ancient black rock that they use as a foundation. And the newer synagogue that's there that was built, I think, two, three hundred years later, was built on top of a synagogue that was there. And that rock dates to a bit before the time of Jesus, which meant just to the left. And I, I didn't include that photo because that modern synagogue wouldn't have been there. So you would just look at that and be too distracted. But it's built on the remains that are there to this day of the very synagogue that Jesus would have attended in Capernaum and no doubt would have spoken. So this is a very real place. You can see the Sea of Galilee back there. And this isn't even like the best picture. I chose this one because of the ruins. But there's a lot of trees, a lot of beautiful vegetation. And a lot of the area in Israel doesn't have a lot of plants. This whole area is very beautiful, lots of fruit trees, a lot of date trees. Um, and I'll show you one other thing, just because it's in the photo. Now you can see to the right, there's a building there, right? So these ruins were found, and it turns out there was some plaster that was coating some of the ruins, and the plaster dated back to the second century. Now why do I bring this up? Because in the second century, plastering some old ruins, that's weird. Plaster was really, really expensive in the second century. 
Whoever did this went to painstaking efforts to try to preserve these ruins. So these were plastered about, oh, let's say, a century and a half after Jesus. But there's a reason I bring all this up. In the plaster, whoever did this had uh, put in the Greek letters, this is the home of the Apostle Peter. So they have now built a museum over it. It's also a church. And there's a glass floor so you can look down on these ruins. And does that prove it's Peter's home? No, no, it doesn't. But it's interesting that enough people thought that in the second century, which is not that long after Jesus, really believe that to spend all this money on it and try to preserve this area. And that there were uh, really um, people that um, would come and see this and travel from various places just to see these old ruins. So that's why you can see why a lot of people think it's legitimate. No matter what, we know Peter lived here. So it's at least indicative of where his home would have been. I, just, I do personally think that was his home. I think there's a reason people went out of their way to visit this area not long after Jesus had left. Now, Jesus didn't come to live in Capernaum, though, just because it's a nice place to live. I think that's part of it. I mean, a lot of fruit grows there. You can get some fish right by the sea. The Galilee's filled with fish. It's warm. You know, it doesn't get cold in the winter like it does in Jerusalem. There's a lot of good reasons to live there. But unlike how many of us would be, and we chose to live there, he did it because it fulfilled scripture. So he intentionally went to live in this town and began his ministry to fulfill a critical passage. Let's continue with Matthew 4, 14 through 17. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, upon them a great light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now Matthew quoted Isaiah 9, 1 through 2 here, where he talks about this area beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, from Isaiah 9, 1 through 2. Now, here's something to think about before I get into this. What would we say is the most famous verse from Isaiah 9? I would bet some of you would say 6. Even if you didn't know the number 6, I think as soon as I quote it, you would go, oh, yeah, that's, that's the verse I know. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And of course, I think all of us know that well, very popular around Christmas. But did you know that this verse is not quoted in the New Testament? We rightly, by the way, attribute it to Jesus. It is rightfully understood that way. It's part of a messianic prophecy that is in the beginning of Isaiah 9. So this verse isn't quoted from that messianic prophecy of Isaiah 9, but verses 1 through 2 are discussing Galilee of the Gentiles. That doesn't make them more important. That just means that for Matthew's purposes to explain what happened here, it was useful to quote uh, Isaiah 9, 1 through 2. Again, doesn't make them more important. But it's certainly interesting, isn't it? If anything, it means we should give them our attention and our interest as we do verse 6. This name, Galilee of the Gentiles, is special. And I believe it has a depth of spiritual meaning that I haven't been able to fully come to terms with. In other words, I can't articulate it to myself. There's some robustness there, some importance that I can't quite put into words. So I'll say that just to be frank with you. But we do know that when Isaiah wrote his prophecy, the Galilee region had suffered from Assyrian occupation. So in the day it's written, there's some Assyrians had been there, no doubt some were there occupying that area. So in that way, it was darkness. It was part of the Holy Land, but some invaders were occupying it. And in Jesus' day, the Galilee region had many non-Jewish people living there. So people from other surrounding nations would often come and live in the Galilee. I think you can see why. It's easy to live where lots of fruit grows and produce grows and you can get fish. So you can see why it's an attractive 
place to live. Now, Jesus is the great light. So this great light that manifests and shines itself in the Galilee region is Jesus himself. Yes, he is light metaphorically, right? He's the light of the world. He, in contrast to sin and darkness, he shows the way. He illuminates. But Jesus is also literally the light because he is the walking, in, walking embodiment of the glory of the Lord. In fact, one of my friends, um, Michael Brown, he likes to say, if you're familiar with the Hebrew term, uh, Shekinah, Shekinah, glory, meaning that light we often see around God's presence in the Old Testament, sort of the energy, the fire that surrounds him. He likes to say that, um, that Jesus is walking Shekinah. He's like manifest in human because he is God's glory. And we will see that truth when we get to his transfiguration. And in fact, I'm going to uh, plant a little seed now. And it's going to be a week or two before we get to Matthew 17, by the way. But in the meantime, just think about this. When Jesus manifests God's glory on that mountain, he wasn't using effort to manifest God's glory. All the rest of the time, he's using effort to suppress his glory because that's how wonderful he is. So he is this walking embodiment of God's glory, and he's preaching in the Galilee. He's starting his ministry in this Galilee region. It was in the Galilee where Jesus pre preached the message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Of course, let's remember that repent really means change of mind, and it quite often does mean repent of sins, change your mind about them, change direction and how you think and do things. Um, however, it's especially pertinent to changing your mind and repenting on who the Messiah is. So go from unbelief and Jesus as the Messiah to belief. You're completely changing direction. That's the critical aspect of repentance because we could repent of sin all day long and not repent about who the Messiah is and trust in him and we would still die in our sins. So not to say that repentance of sin isn't important, it is, but the main thing is to repent and change your mind about who Jesus is. Now, why was the kingdom of heaven at hand? I mean, it was at hand back then. That was 2,000 years ago. So surely the kingdom must have been fulfilled, right? I mean, it was at hand. That means it's really close, right? It's about to happen. And that is often what is argued. But I believe the best way to read Matthew's gospel, if you read it consistently, is it was at hand. Why? Because Jesus was there. He's the king. I am in your midst. I am very present with you. And when I am here, it's at hand, meaning if you would repent and trust in me and Messiah as your Lord, and you really believe with your heart who I am as a nation, the kingdom will be made permanent. It won't just be around where I am, because it's always around Jesus. I always go so far as to say, he almost can't help himself, because the kingdom surrounds him. But it can be made permanent and manifest among you. God can dwell among you. If you would repent, trust in me, kingdom will be delivered. And Jesus will continue to say things like this until Matthew 12. Until the unpardonable sin happens. Israel rejects sin. They say he does work by the power of the devil. He never says this again. And I think that's very important to note. But right now, it's available. Repent, believe in me. The kingdom can manifest itself. It was the Galilee region that first witnessed Jesus' public ministry. More people, both Jews and Gentiles, came to believe the gospel and trust in Jesus in the Galilee region than anywhere else in the Holy Land. In this way, it seems to me the Galilee of the Gentiles, this quote, or Galilee of the nations, you could translate it that way, foreshadowed the body of Christ in the current age between the first and the second coming. Sort of foreshadowed it in a way. Didn't mean it prophesied it. But where Jews and Gentiles would be united in Christ. Because this is an area with a lot of Jews and Gentiles. And Jesus is fairly well received in this region compared to any other. I, it's relatively. It's always relative, right? And this would be looking forward to that time when all Israel would believe. So... Galilee region, some people believe Jews and Gentiles, sort of points to this time right now in a prophetic way, sort of a foreshadow where right now is the body of Christ. People of all ethnicities are open to loving Jesus and being his people. 
and pointing to that day when all of Israel will believe. And in fact, most, to this day, if you were to go to Israel, most Christians, or most Messianic Jews, however they want to call themselves, most followers of Jesus, Yeshua, guess what area of Israel they live in? The Galilee. You know, you go to Jerusalem, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, Orthodox Jews. You go to the Galilee region, there's a bunch of people just worshiping Jesus. So it's, it's kind of incredible 2,000 years later how this, you see these historical parallels. It was in Galilee that Jesus also called his first disciples. I'll read verses 18 through 22. Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, <clears throat> he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. All right. Um, there, I, as I often like to preach from the New American Standard Bible, the 1995 update. Now, there was a 2020 update, and I was excited because some of the early translation changes I thought were some good improvements. They were uh, kind of tightened what the meaning was and cleared up things. But when the full translation came out, I just was curious, so I just happened to turn to this verse early on. And I looked down, and I saw it in verse 19 where Jesus and it says this, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And I just said, no, this won't do. This, this is not going to happen. That's out. This is out. No, no 2020 update for me. So um, I say that to me because who here thinks in this context men means only males? Exactly. <laughs> we don't even pander to. So there's this just reads better. I say that, though, to illustrate the idea is to go out and get people. I didn't think anyone thought otherwise, but just in case, given that they changed it in a translation. Soon after beginning his ministry, Jesus brought in others to help. Did he need their help? He's the eternal son of God. Did he need their help to do this? No. There are 12 tribes in Israel. By eventually choosing 12 followers, Jesus was, think of it this way, he's beginning a new phase in Israel's history. Sort of like a rebirth, so to speak, right? Because we have these 12 sons of Jacob, who were the great patriarchs, and then Israel's divided the nation by these 12. And now we have 12 new leaders under Messiah, as if to illustrate there's, a, there's something very different starting now, a very new phase or iteration of Israel's history. And in fact, remember, we talked about this before when John the Baptist said that God could raise up out of these stones new children for Abraham. And of course, those were 12 stones in the Jordan. So there's, we see this starting to manifest itself. Now I want to show you something else in verse 19 where it says, And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You know, in the Greek, let's get a little bit dorky here. It's in the historical present. And that means our translation says, And he said, like past tense. But you know, in the Greek, it's present tense. So it says, And he is saying to them. Why? This happened 2,000 years ago. Why is it in present tense? That's because Matthew wants you to read this verse as if it was happening now. What would be his purpose for you to read this as if it was being spoken as you read it? He wants you to apply that to yourself as the reader. That's very powerful that he decided to do this. Matthew doesn't use historical present that much. John uses it a lot. Sort of a teaching technique. But Matthew... In this, one of these cases, he really wants you to read this and go, oh, he's talking to me as well. Who here has ever read some of the Gospels and felt like Jesus was speaking directly to you? I have. Yeah, it's as if the pages have a heartbeat. There's a life to them. And in fact, the Greek, in many times, wants you to read it that way. It's meant to be read that way. It's very, very encouraging. So he is saying to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 
And we're meant to apply these words of Jesus to ourselves. If we're followers of him, then he wants us to go out and fish for people, fish for men. And you know what? He is. He is the Messiah, and he is who we should rightfully follow. And if we follow him, then he will empower us to bring others to him. Now, for all their faults, Peter and Andrew, they didn't hesitate to follow Jesus. We know they have a lot of faults in the New Testament. People like to bring it up. But, to be fair, they follow him immediately. And that attitude turned two fishermen into two of the most important and influential human beings who have ever lived. Think about that. Now, this certainly isn't to denigrate uh, their job. Fishermen was a very, very important job in the first century. So it's extremely important. I mean, you know, you got to eat, right? So this very important job. However, they went from having this position because they had this attitude to immediately follow the Messiah and just trust in him. Now, look, they're remembered forever and they will be in heaven for eternity. They'll always be remembered as these great saints and they'll be honored forever. In eternity, you who bring in fish for the Lord, or even try, by the way, even if you try, you just spread the gospel, you will also be among the most influential people who have ever lived. Because in eternity, the, all that will matter is who is influential is on who served the Lord well, who brought glory to his name. That's all that's going to matter. And all the history that we're in, all of human history, will seem so small and insignificant compared to eternity. So that's really where you want to try to get fame or you want to feel importance, there's nothing wrong with that. Just put it in the right way. That's the real, that's the long game. You want to get long-term importance. Go out, fish for men. Let's look at verse 23. Jesus is going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Now, some teach, and I understand why, by the way, so this isn't a criticism, but some teach that this gospel, the quote-unquote gospel of the kingdom, is different than the later gospel succinctly stated in places like Acts uh, 16.31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And I think you can see why, right? One's called gospel of the kingdom, the other one is trust in Jesus Christ and you'll have eternal life, you'll be saved from sin. And I, you can see why they, people say, well, these are two different good news, right? They're two different good sets of good news. I don't believe they're different gospels myself. Rather, they're the same gospel with a different emphasis, right? Because they're highly related, but one is given a certain moment of time to one people, and then there's a different emphasis later. Both require faith in Jesus as God and Savior. But before Jesus had been rejected and gone to the cross, the nation of Israel had the opportunity for the kingdom to be established if they placed their full trust in who Jesus was. So that would be the natural emphasis of the overall gospel here. Trust in me, you'll get the kingdom. That's natural. But after Jesus had gone to the cross, it's only natural that the emphasis of the gospel would change to trust in him, have eternal life. Both were always, both remain true, but they have their place historically when they're preached. That is to say, and this is especially true if they're the same gospel, I think they are. Even before Jesus went to the cross, he personally preached the gospel. And he had his followers preach the gospel. The point is that the core of Jesus' ministry was the gospel. Now, I have a quote from John Calvin for you this morning. It's my favorite Calvin quote, and it has nothing to do with predestination. That's for you, Wayne. It's on the importance of the gospel. In Calvin's preface to a French translation of the New Testament, he didn't translate, but he was asked to write the preface. Or, and that's why I almost like it more, because... If you're asked to write a preface, it's often not a work you've devoted yourself to. You're just, let me write an introduction and help you out with a, 
add a different voice to what you're doing. So he's asked to write this preface on the New Testament, and it's just fantastic. I'm, gonna, I'm only going to read the first paragraph for time's sake. Here it is. Without the gospel, everything is useless and vain. Without the gospel, we are not Christians. Without the gospel, all riches is poverty. All wisdom is folly before God. Strength is weakness. And all the justice of man is under the condemnation of God. But by the knowledge of the gospel, we are made children of God, brothers of Jesus Christ, fellow townsmen with the saints, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, heirs of God with Jesus Christ, by whom the poor are made rich, the weak strong, the fools wise, the sinner justified, the desolate comforted, the doubting sure, and slaves free. It is the power of God for the salvation of all those who believe. Wow, I'll tell you what. If institutes of the Christian religion read like that the whole time, I'd read it more often. Fantastic. Absolutely. Let's look at verses 24 through 25. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. In tandem with Jesus preaching the gospel was him healing people of every kind of sickness and disease. So he's preaching the gospel, healing is happening. When the Son of God preached the gospel, it was as if he could not help but heal people. And people getting healed, no doubt, brought attention to what Jesus was saying it testified to who he is. Jesus' miracles, in fact, testified that the kingdom was active since he himself was active. The Messiah was active. He's there preaching. He's doing things. These miracles are being produced. And that sort of testifies the kingdom is in your midst. It's available to you because you can see some of the miracles already happening. Even though the kingdom isn't fully activated, it hasn't become permanent. But just because Jesus is there... His very presence, miracles are happening, just natural. And the kingdom could become permanent if the nation would trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Of course, as we know, the nation didn't come to trust in Jesus, as they should have. But I assure you, they will in the future. And I can know that for sure because God's word says it in very, very clear language. Amen. In the meantime, the great calling of our lives as followers of Jesus in the interim between the two great pole stars of the New Testament, the first and second coming of Christ, in that interim, we as followers of Jesus are to make to know him and to make him known. That is our great calling. When we preach the gospel, spiritual healing comes to all who gladly accept it. And you know what? God absolutely does physically heal people today. With the Holy Spirit's guidance, we can be used to powerfully preach the gospel. And then don't be surprised if God decides to demonstrate his power when you faithfully go out and fish for men. You can do it in exciting and unexpected ways. To conclude, I do think that our Creator wants us to enjoy our lives. So I say that because I don't want you to hear this message and go, He's saying my life only has meaning when I'm preaching the gospel. No, I'm not saying that. I don't think... This might surprise you to hear this, or a pastor say this. I don't think he expects us to spend all our time spreading the gospel and making disciples. I don't think that's uh, the point of what Jesus is telling us. And practically speaking, most Christians have responsibilities in life that they have to do. And it makes it impractical to always be focused on spreading the gospel. I mean, the reality is we do have to work. And you know what? I think God wants to enjoy our families and our lives as well. So there, that is a reality. But at the same time, the gospel must be at the core of who we are, at the core of our being. And spreading the gospel should be our heart's desire. When it is our desire, then we may find the right opportunities to make Jesus known that we would have otherwise missed if we make that the core of our being. Calvin was right. Without the gospel, everything is useless and vain. Spreading the gospel, making disciples is the greatest thing we could do. It doesn't take away from the rest of our lives. It doesn't drain us of our time. 
Rather, it brings meaning and joy to those other aspects of our lives. It helps us love others more. It helps us appreciate the life we have more and enjoy it more. It helps us enjoy our families and our work more. There is a Galilee region just outside this building, in our local community and beyond. There's a Galilee across this nation. There's a darkness over it right now that seems to be spreading, to be quite honest with you. <clears throat> so let's fight that in a way that politics never can. I'm not saying it's, we shouldn't be political. I think we should be active. But there is a power that goes beyond politics. It's the power of the gospel that can really transform people and nations in a way nothing else can. So let's go forth and tell others about a great light that is available to them to come and break through the darkness and bring spiritual and possibly even physical healing to their lives and joy and purpose. That great light, let's tell them about him, Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. Lord, Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to come into this world, to come into an entire world of darkness and to displace it with the reality of who he is. Lord, not only by manifesting his glory, but by not sinning, by showing us the way, by demonstrating to us who we need to follow. Lord, we want to thank you that despite him being sinless, he went to the cross, took our punishment, which he did not deserve, so that we could have his righteousness. Lord, in response, please place within us a desire to go out and serve him and his community. Lord, we ask that you bring us joy and peace and happiness in doing so, because that is the natural result that should occur when we are really faithfully serving you, that it brings joy to our lives. So we would ask that you would place within us a burning desire to do so. And Lord, if we already have that desire, place more of a desire within us. And then help us to see opportunities where we may make disciples in our community and in this world beyond. It's in this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.